Hi everyone. Good to see you on my channel today. Today I will tell you a wonderful story. It is full of love and kindness. I hope you enjoy it and I wish you an enjoyable viewing experience. Thank you. For the first time, Seam was in this office, while a well-groomed blonde with a commanding appearance sat at the desk, talking to him on the phone. He furtively looked at the spacious room. The furnishings were stylish, ultra-modern, functional, and obviously insanely expensive. CN was flattered at heart that the CEO of a chain of private clinics was receiving him personally, though she could easily have assigned it to one of her many deputies. Excuse me, that was a very important call. The tall boss put the phone aside. Let's continue. And so from now on, CN Foster, you are the chief doctor of our best clinic. There was not a single objection to your candidacy. Your impeccable reputation is worth a lot. Your credentials are top-notch as well. I'm not going to lie. I am proud that we were able to get such a brilliant surgeon. I hope you will live up to our expectations, of course. Now most of your time will be taken up by administrative work. I'll do my best. Foster nodded with dignity, though he was bursting with a kind of unrestrained boyish joy. Yes, please try, the blonde smiled slightly. We had enough problems with your predecessor. By the way, I was wondering... What made James leave such a prestigious clinic? Did he find a better place? Cian hesitated. I wouldn't like to bring it up, the lady said in an icy tone. But I'll answer you. We didn't want to make a fuss. That's the only reason we let James resign at his own request. Apparently, he imagined himself all-powerful, deciding everything and everything and everything. In short, financial fraud. I see. See in Foster. I'm sorry, but you don't seem happy about your appointment. You look so preoccupied. With some surprise, remarked the CEO. What are you saying, Jane Morrison? Sian laughed. It's just that the day after tomorrow I'm supposed to fly overseas on vacation. I haven't had a vacation in three years, and here it is. But don't worry about it. I just don't want to have to deal with ticket refunds and travel vouchers. Well, that's such a trifle. The boss waved her hand with ease. For how long were you planning to leave for two weeks? So go ahead and rest easy. Your deputy, Peter Spencer, is now acting chief physician and is doing a great job. He's been with the clinic for eight years. A very responsible, knowledgeable man. And after you rest, get to work. We need you fresh and rested. There is a lot of work to be done. I'd like to review some documents on vacation. Get up to speed, so to speak, admitted Foster. It's possible, of course. I'll make some calls now. Already in the car scene took a breath. No vacation abroad was out of the question. More precisely, he thought that it would be nice to fly somewhere in August. But there were no hot deals or pre-purchased plane tickets. Foster had always trusted his intuition, and now it told him not to rush in without a thorough checkup. Something in his head did not add up. Seen was ready to start work tomorrow. He had waited so long for this day, and if it had not been about Hugh James, Foster had no doubt. He had known Hugh since his days at medical school, and they had even worked together for three years at one of the district hospitals. Hugh James was one of the best students in his class, a man of crystal honesty and some kind of nefarious fraud. And if the clinic had some financial problems, it was certainly not the fault of the new chief doctor, who had only been in office for six months. So Hugh was framed. But who was it? Foster was going to find out without putting it off. At home, he leafed through an old notebook. He hadn't kept in touch with James for years. It was unlikely that his comrade's phone number was still up. To date, we should call Monica. She was the former headmistress of the course, even twenty years after graduation remained an invaluable source of information for former classmates. Cian was right in his hunch. Ten minutes later, after heartily thanking Monica for James' new phone number, he called Hugh. After mutual greetings of unusual worldly rubbish, Hugh suddenly supposedly remembered, Yes, Cian, I completely forgot. 
Congratulations on your new assignment. You deserve it. I hope you do well in this garden spot. That's actually why I'm calling, Cien confessed. I'd like to ask you some questions. Why don't we meet somewhere? Let's talk, have a drink. I'd love to. But I'm in England now, at my mother-in-law's, and I need to recover from all this filth. You've probably been told that I'm a great crook, he sounded bitter. I didn't believe a word of it, Foster said honestly. Don't I know you? I just wanted to ask you what happened there. You were set up. One hundreds. To be honest, I don't even really understand why the clinic suffered such losses. The mechanism seems to be fine. Tuned, everything works like clockwork. There are no complaints from clients, and you know what kind of people are treated there. My gullibility ruined me, Hugh admitted. It never occurred to me that there was something wrong in the clinic. All the records are in order. I have a lot of surgery myself, so I let the administrative duties on their own. Fool, what else can I say? But do you have any idea who might have set you up like that? Foster didn't back down. Anybody. There's a collective, Hugh grinned wickedly. In fact, this Spencer, as they say, is a thorough grey cardinal. Peter had already outwitted three head doctors. The sly spider and Hugh the fool had fallen into the spider's web. James laughed unhappily. After the conversation with his comrade, Foster was left with an unpleasant residue. They had broken Hugh, the bastards. They had spat into his soul with their shameful accusations. But Foster was not so easy. He does not intend to answer for the sins of others. So what's the first thing to do? Cien remembered the file. Foster already had administrative experience at his previous job. He was a deputy chief physician. We should take a close look at all the paperwork. Maybe we'll find some clues. Foster had been sitting up all night. Apparently his knowledge was insufficient. All the financial documents looked in order. So what was the reason for the loss? Shouldn't he show the papers to someone more experienced in such matters? No. It is a very risky venture. One can't involve third parties. You will have to solve the tangled puzzles yourself. Or maybe I should give up this homegrown investigation. A treacherous thought crept in. To go to work quietly and not to play Sherlock Holmes. You, of course, is neither a crook nor a thief. That was out of the question. But he had been absent-minded and not particularly observant since his youth. He confessed that he spent more time on surgical work than on paperwork. So he was negligent once or twice, and then it went south. Money likes to count. After a second, Sien was ashamed of his own thoughts. No, he was not an ostrich. He would not bury his head in the sand. And then he remembered the words of his father, for whom the words about the honor of a doctor were not an empty word. A doctor without honor and conscience is hopeless. Foster thought he heard his father's soft, slightly husky voice. Our profession takes vicious revenge on the greedy, the indifferent, the talentless. Sooner or later, some of them get to court. Some lose their gift, and most just drink, stifling the remnants of conscience. Cian smiled. He worshipped his father, God rest his soul. And was there a single person in the world who could say something bad about Steve Foster? Cian grew up in a family of doctors. His father was a surgeon by God, the chief doctor of the regional provincial hospital. His mother, Maria Foster, was a respected general practitioner at a municipal outpatient clinic. Since childhood, Paul knew that he would be a surgeon, like Steve Foster, although from an early age he saw all the difficulties of the profession. His father was hardly ever home. He could be called to work in the middle of the night. Often he would rush to the hospital right from the festive table, apologizing to the guests, gathered to wish him a happy birthday. I have achieved something in my profession only thanks to your mother. My father often repeated fondly, kissing the hand of his beloved wife. Your mother has always understood me and accepted me, and accepted me as I am. She and I were one and the same. Steve Foster wasn't exaggerating at all. Paul had never once seen a parent fight. 
Mom was a doctor by profession and supported her husband in every endeavor. Young Paul in the shadows dreamed of just such a future wife. Despite the constant busyness, the parents managed to keep up with life as a family. They went out of town finding time for skiing and camping. On weekends, the Foster's spacious apartment was sure to have visitors. My father's colleagues, my mother's friends, my childhood friends. Many still remember the taste of Maria Foster's signature dishes. Parents did not have noisy feasts with heavy drinking. It was the usual lunches and dinners or just evening tea parties with friends. My father passed away when Paul was barely 23. Tough, lively, never complained of health Foster Sr. Just a couple of months burned from an incurable disease. Sian still thanks God for the fact that he managed to please the already hopelessly ill Steve with a red diploma in medicine of the chief physician of the district hospital. The whole town buried his father. Sian then thought that if at least a third of that number of people came in due time to see me off, it meant that my life was not in vain. It was dawn outside the window, but Foster was still sitting at his desk, staring at a pile of papers. No, it doesn't work like that. He's not thinking straight. He's got a cast, iron head, and needs a good night's sleep. Scene was already dozing when he suddenly remembered a funny incident from his childhood. One day, Foster and his family were watching some historical movie. The young reformist king longed to transform his country into an enlightened, developed state. The monarch was very clever, so he did not much believe the reports of lying nobles, who, to hide their own sins, deliberately misled him to know the whole truth. The young king sometimes made secret forays into the city. He and two of his most trusted servants would disguise themselves as commoners and, under cover of darkness, sneak out of the palace gates through an underground passage. I envy that king. Steve Foster laughed then. I wish I could do that. A hospital is a kind of small state. You can't keep track of everything, no matter how hard you try to pretend to be a nurse and find out the truth about what's going on inside. I wish I could, even the babies in the maternity, ward know my face. And that thought scene even rose in bed. Yes, an audacious, risky idea, a pure gamble. But it's worth a try. Realizing that he would never fall asleep, Foster went to the kitchen and brewed himself coffee with each sip of fragrant coffee. He liked the idea more and more. The clinic wasn't expecting a new boss until two weeks later. The nursing staff doesn't know him by sight. But maybe someone had seen his portrait in the newspaper. But sometimes they print such pictures that you don't recognize yourself. If he introduced himself as a regular orderly, got a job at the clinic, he'd have plenty of time and opportunity to get to know the inside. Sean took another sip of coffee and paced the room in thought. Before, he had only seen the agents sent there in the movies. So, no, but the idea is good, adventurous, risky, but quite doable. Well, if they find out, they'll expose him. You can always turn everything into a joke. It's unlikely anyone would dare to say to the chief doctor's face that he is prone to idiotic, practical joke. Better, of course, not to find out. Monica Perkins will have to call the former head of the course again. Foster could hardly wait until a decent time for a morning call. Monica, hi. Did I wake you up? Do you remember? About a year and a half ago, we were sitting in a coffee shop and you showed me pictures of your son's birthday. You were there as a black pirate, remember? Of course, you didn't even recognize me then. Monica laughed. My friend Carla was a first-rate makeup artist. I agree, Foster nodded impatiently. Can't you give me her number? We're trying to pull a prank on a friend on his birthday. He's a man of substance, and we need to be changed beyond recognition. Don't even doubt it. Her mother wouldn't know, Monica reassured her. Carl Foster's makeup artist liked it. She did not ask unnecessary questions, answered clearly on the merits. Sian briefly outlined the situation to her on the phone, saying he wanted to play a joke on a friend. A whole day having worked in orderly, under his nose. Ridiculous. 
Carla expressed herself discreetly. Do you have a picture? It's much more efficient to work that way. Whose picture? The future chief physician was confused. Well, an orderly or something. You want to replace someone in particular so your buddy doesn't get suspicious, don't you? You know, Carla, I hadn't even thought of that. But that's okay. You think over all the nuances and call me and we'll arrange a meeting. The conversation with the makeup girl sent Foster into a panic. A thought suddenly came to his mind, the first thing that should have occurred to him. What kind of paperwork was he going to show when he was hired? Where was he going to get his employment book? Insurance certificate and other important pieces of paper without which he would not be allowed on the doorstep in a prestigious clinic to buy a fake nonsense. Not enough more problems with the law to borrow from someone, and who can bring copies of the documents to lie that the originals burned, for example. Try to persuade him to accept the probationary period without the documents, which are about to be ready, and if he is not hired, there will be no second attempt. Isn't there a particular orderly you want to replace? Suddenly the words came to mind, Foster's dressing room man, Marshall. He needs Ron. Ron wouldn't refuse to help if he was honest about it. Ron Marshall worked as an orderly at the hospital where Sian Foster used to be the deputy chief physician. The entire nursing staff discussed their resemblance in amazement. The men didn't look like twins, but still, people were always surprised to see them side by side. Both were about the same age, in their early 40s, and the same height. By the way, both had blonde hair, solid figures, and firm cheekbones. True, Ron wore glasses and a small mustache, and Foster couldn't stand facial vegetation. Sean Foster usually maintained the necessary distance between himself and his subordinates, but he had a special relationship with Ron. Several years ago, he had literally saved Marshall's youngest daughter from death by performing the most complicated operation. And since then, Ron considered himself eternally indebted to the brilliant surgeon. Three years earlier, Ron had inherited from his grandmother a good-sized house in the countryside with a large plot of land. Ron had dreamed all his life of tinkering with the earth, having his own garden and vegetable garden and vegetable garden. When his dream suddenly came true, the man quit his job without a second thought, got two cows, piglets, poultry from his farm and fed himself and he fed well at the city market for his sour cream, milk, cottage cheese, vegetables and fruits, all the goods from the counter were swept away in a matter of minutes. Now the village house looked like a toy. There were two cars in the yard. All in all, the former orderly was not poor. Foster relaxed with his soul in the countryside. He took a steam bath, drank fresh milk, picked a basket of plums and grapes. His mother would love it. Marshall wasn't too surprised at his former boss's unusual request. He sat and thought, then he spoke. Paul, I don't mind lending you my papers. I don't need my workbook yet. You and I look alike, and if your makeup girl works, we'll be twins. You can't tell the difference. But I think we have to work a little finer here. Let me do it myself, so that I don't get suspicious. Why? My papers, my face. How can you be suspicious? And then you go on stage. Not many people pay attention to the orderlies. Sometimes they don't think of them as people. So they won't look at you either. It's true that the job of an orderly, though not difficult, is hard. You can do it. Don't even think about it. Foster grinned. When I was a student, I worked every summer at my father's hospital as an orderly. School was tough. My dad never let me get away with it. The next day, Foster and Marshall met in Carla's dressing room. The girl jumped as soon as she looked at the man. But it's a half hour's work. You look a lot like her. Do you wear sunglasses? She turned to Ron. It's good. I've got part of my face covered already. And you see him? You need a haircut and a mustache. And that's it. It's not even interesting. Won't the mustache come off? Sian showed concern. You're insulting, the client poked the girl. Especially since you've only been with them for a day, nothing works. Outside, Foster shared his doubts with his companion. 
Something about this mustache makes me uneasy. It is unlikely to solve all the issues in 24 hours. It's okay. The mustache is a good thing, Ron reassured him. I'll show up with a mustache. Then you'll wear it for a day and then take it off like you decided to shave your mustache. And a man without a mustache changes a lot. So no one's going to catch you cheating. Okay, stomped on the market. Why? Foster wondered. Boss, you're awfully far from the people. Hiding a smile, Marshall explained. Are you going to play orderlies in your brand clothes? Ordinary people don't dress in boutiques. We'll get you some stage costumes. You can fall down on every little thing here. We need not only clothes and shoes, but also underwear, socks and towels, razors, bathroom accessories, toothpaste, and a purse to match your role. You must have some kind of card and underwear. Calvin Klein, but you take your clothes off in the shower somewhere and there's Klein under your pants. Don't let it get to you that regular orderlies don't know about fashion brands. They can tell the cheap stuff from the quality stuff. Two days later, the implementation operation began. Foster drove Ron to the gates of the clinic, and he went to the interview. Cian drove the car to a secluded place and waited for the return of his volunteer assistant. Ron had been gone for two hours. Foster was beginning to burn with impatience. When Marshall sat down next to him, Cian immediately pounced on him with questions. Yes, that went well. What else could it be? It took that bastard Spencer an hour and a half to torture me in the waiting room. He wanted to show his importance. He was a slippery guy. But you had to have a keen eye, like me, to know that, at first glance, he seemed nice, a well-groomed man. Handsome, intelligent, polite. No authority figures, in short. He knew how to rub it in my face. He suspected you of what? Marshall laughed. Paul, you're really going to blow your cover. You think Spencer's job description is to catch spies and saboteurs? An ordinary man came to apply for a job. What's the catch? Notice that he came in broad daylight, not sneaking out under the cover of night. You'll be fine. The only thing is that Peter was very surprised that I'm over 40. He said they mostly had young guys working as orderlies and suggested that it would be difficult for me to get along with them. What did you say? I said that 40 years old is not a sentence. I have experience. I'm physically strong. I'm in good health. Well, what else do you need? Anyway, he put me on probation. Tomorrow morning's your shift. You know Spencer by sight, and you'll get to know the others as you go along. Good luck with that. C. N. Foster had been working at the clinic as an orderly for four days, but hadn't made an inch of progress toward his goal. At first glance, the hospital seemed to be in order. The clinic worked like a well-oiled machine. The medical staff knew their business excellently on the patient's side. And among the rich people, there were sometimes very capricious, picky individuals. There were no special complaints. Private clinic, due to its excellent reputation, was a success with the powers that be. So there was no shortage of patients, including those occupying the VIP rooms. As a newcomer, Foster was hesitant to ask direct questions of his colleagues yet, especially since the rest of the orderlies kept apart from the old man in their behavior did not show any ulterior motive. Just the young guys had their own conversations, their own interests listening to other people's conversations in the canteen and locker room. Cian found out that the young guys were very reluctant to work the night shift in order to build relationships with the staff. The man often took over other people's work, coming to the clinic, well before the start of the day and letting his replacement go home early. There were no criticisms from the superiors about the new nurse. He was an experienced worker. He knew his job well to clean, wash, serve the vessel, help the nurses, turn over or change a bed, ridden patient, prepare a patient for surgery. Marshall worked hard, diligently doing the job quickly. And one day, meeting Chief Medical Officer Spencer in the hallway, Foster stopped him and suggested, Peter Spencer, if you ever need to fill in or take the night shift, I'm happy to do it. That's commendable, Spencer said politely. We always need extra hands, but would your wife and daughters like that kind of zeal? So all the extra money will go to my girls, Sean reasonably said. 
so my family doesn't mind. Here Foster was telling the truth. His family really didn't mind, except that he hadn't had any family for a long time. He'd been divorced for five years. Seen got married at 30, as they say, already at a conscious age. The young, talented surgeon had always liked women. He was happy to meet with them, beautifully courtship, nobly parted, but was in no hurry to tie the bonds of marriage. The example of his parents' happy marriage was before his eyes. He wanted to meet the one and only girl and live with her in love and harmony until the end of his days. He would always have time to put a stamp in his passport and have children. The respectable young doctor met by chance. He came to a friend's birthday party and he introduced him to his own sister. Foster fell in love instantly like a boy. The slender, graceful brunette with blue eyes attracted male attention like a magnet. Seen asked her to dance. During a light-hearted conversation, he discovered that his new acquaintance is not only charming, beautiful, but also educated, witty, tactful, and he finally lost his head. He proposed to Brooke. After two weeks of acquaintance, and almost went crazy with happiness. When the girl told him yes, and she didn't say those cherished words right away. They didn't get married until a year later. Sian couldn't get enough of his beautiful wife. His friends and his mother also liked the charming, well-mannered and hospitable Brooke. The only thing that surprised Foster and his wife was an adamant unwillingness to work. Graduating from the University of Education, the girl never worked a day in her field. She declared that she was not going to say the same thing year after year to the negligent, spoiled, and defiant students. Seen, as a man who literally burned at work, felt that without what he loved, it would not be long before he died of boredom. But Brooke maintained that she had enough to worry about at home as a hostess and young woman. Even the meanest neighbor couldn't complain. The cozy apartment was perfectly clean. Brooke cooked beautifully. Every night, Scene had a delicious dinner waiting for him at home. Give birth to children the 25-year-old wife did not want. However, at the time, Foster, too, did not feel a burning need to quickly become a father. At first, Scene firmly believed that Brooke would understand him and support in everything, just as his mother supported his father but with each passing year, Foster became increasingly convinced that his dream was not destined to come true. On the one hand, the wife was genuinely proud of the resounding success of her talented husband, who by then had become a leading surgeon and was earning good money. But on the other hand, Brooke the hell annoyed and resented the constant absence of her husband. They could not even go on vacation properly. At the last minute, scene always had some more important things to do related to saving other people's lives. Do you realize you can't save everyone? Some Superman you are. If you have to save everybody all the time, save your own wife from boredom and loneliness, and don't ask me to look for a job. I'm not a slacker. I've got enough to do at home. It's been 100 years since we went out together. I'll soon forget the human language. In these moments, the workaholic Foster sincerely felt guilty. Fully trusting his beloved wife, he suggested that she go out to have fun with friends, visit his mother in another city more often, go to the resort with his best friend. At first, his wife resented his words. But one day, she decided to take advantage of her husband's suggestion and went to Mexico with two girlfriends. Brooke was increasingly absent from home, almost neglecting all the chores and sometimes Foster, returning late from work, had to go to bed without waiting for his wife. So he wasn't too surprised when one day Brooke asked him for a divorce, saying she had fallen in love with another man. The couple had no children. Mutual financial claims, too, as Foster left the apartment to his ex-wife. The separation with his wife did not really change Scene's life. Now he could fully devote himself to the business he loved, without the disgusting feeling of guilt. Sian did not allow himself to despair, but a fact is a fact. He had not yet reached his goal. In ten days, the new chief physician was to take up his duties. If nothing was found out by that time, 
What an impenetrable idiot Foster would remain in the eyes of the staff, who, of course, would recognize him as an orderly marshal. But fortune soon smiled on the surgeon. That night he came to the clinic to start the night shift. Barely had Marshall had time to change his clothes when the head nurse sent him to the ward. Bernard accidentally knocked over his dinner tray. It must be cleaned up immediately. Bernard Whitson does not like to wait, hurry scene, grabbing a mop and a rag. He went up to the third floor. The door to room 12 was slightly ajar. Foster was on his way in, but the conversation in the room caused him to linger at the door. He saw Bernard, deputy mayor of the city, holding out a tightly stuffed envelope to the attending physician. That's the whole amount for the treatment counted. What is it, Bernard Whitson? The doctor waved his hands. What kind of calculations could there be when a patient paid in cash for his stay and treatment in the clinic? Cien was convinced when he was removing the shards of broken dishes from the floor in the room. Bernard suddenly sniggered. Your clinic is expensive. The money flies away, but they treat you good too. Foster was shocked by the picture he saw. Why did Bernard give the money to the doctor and not pay at the cashier's office? As he should. Why did he pay in cash? When today even the most ignorant pensioners know how to use a bank card, what is there to hide? In the morning, when the chief of surgery asked an orderly to clean the floor in his office, Sean decided to ask him a few questions, to play the bona fide fool. Thomas Ford, doesn't your clinic pay through the cash register? Strange, such a respectable institution, but do patients slip money to doctors in an envelope? Or is this a bribe? What the hell are you talking about? I don't get it, manager. What bribes? This is a private hospital. You pay the money and you're welcome to it. Of course, all payments go through the cash register. What kind of a weird question is that? I saw Bernard holding out an envelope to one of our doctors yesterday, so I was surprised. But this is a common practice. Our VIPs don't like to bother with such things as going to the accounting department and so on. That's okay. That money ends up in the Vedomasti sooner or later anyway. The clinic doesn't incur any losses anyway. This is a statement with which Foster would gladly argue. And what a loss. Every unaccounted for patient who occupies someone else's room is a huge loss for patients who are willing to pay as they should. There is nowhere to accommodate them because all the rooms are occupied and these patients are ghosts, bringing no income to the clinic who are too lazy to deal with. The simple procedure of paying for treatment. So they have plenty of helpers for such boring affairs. If the rich customers are paying around the cash register, then into whose pockets is flowing a pretty penny? Foster was convinced that he had found an explanation for the financial problems. All that remained was to answer the ultimate question of who was behind the machinations. However, he already had a very reasonable suspicion about the identity of the main puppeteer. Sian tried to discuss his concerns with his colleagues, but all his attempts failed, as if he ran into a wall of incomprehension and mistrust. Ron, do you want this? What? Who? When? Where? Sincerely bewildered Chunky Andrew. Our business is small. Did a good job, got a paycheck, and by the way, not a bad paycheck. Why get into all these subtlety? I personally am not interested in all this traffic with the Vipe department. Let the doctors and admins rack their brains. Faced several times with similar answers, Foster understood. Most likely, the junior nurses also have some share of the funds, in half fighting on the side, so they prefer to keep quiet. There was no doubt in Foster's mind that there was active collusion among the staff, for just a couple of hours after talking to one of the orderlies, he was summoned to his office by Spencer. As soon as Cian entered the office, Peter pounced on him like an enraged Rottweiler. What do you think you're doing, Marshal? Who authorized you to wander around asking strange, and I would even say dangerous, provocative questions? Suddenly Spencer's usual politeness failed, and he suddenly turned to rudeness. Marshal, who do you think you are? What are you, a newspaper stooge? Are you an investigative reporter? What kind of journalist am I, Peter Spencer? Foster's hands were kind, heartedly thrown around. It's just that I'm new here. 
I'm trying to adjust somehow. Some things I do not understand. So I ask colleagues, you don't have to understand anything. It's your job to haul ducks, orderly. Spencer's got all the glamour he's acquired over the years. He's out there sniffing around. Do you want to lose your job? Why should I be fired? Sian asked reasonably. I do my job honestly, in good faith. No complaints. They will. And I'll make it easy for you, Peter Spencer threatened. You think I can't find something to nail you for? I'd rather you quit your job. It's obvious you don't fit in here. They pay me good money here. It's stupid to quit. Can I go? A nurse asked me to help with a difficult patient. Go on then. Spencer grinned meaningfully, letting the orderly go. From that moment on, Foster was having a hard time. Doctors and nurse mistress, as if in conspiracy, piled on him the heaviest and dirtiest work, with which Sian simply physically could not cope. Under unspoken orders from Spencer, Nurse Marshall's every move was strictly monitored every shift. He was met at the entrance by the nurse, the hostess with an invisible stopwatch in her hands. But the punctual subordinate did not give the supervisor a single chance to catch him being late. The attitude of the fellow orderlies also changed dramatically. The young man avoided any conversation with the ubiquitous old man. They began to mock him openly, reveling in total impunity. The disgraced orderly was shunned like a leper. It went so far that when Foster appeared in the locker room, everyone who was there abruptly got up and left, especially Sian felt himself a black sheep in the dining room when he came with a tray in his hands to the table of co-workers, and they did not let him take an empty seat. It's busy here. Foster had to eat alone at the table and the chair from which he had been driven attracted everyone's attention with its gaping emptiness for the rest of the meal. It cost Foster a tremendous effort not to reveal his identity, to feel like an outcast in the collective. It's hard to bear insults, even when you're playing someone else's role. These few days were a serious test for the new chief physician, but not everyone was hostile and wary of orderly marshal. At lunch one day, a nurse from the surgical department came up to the table where he was sitting alone. May I join you? She asked with a smile and put her tray on the table. That wonderful smile was light and bright. Foster noticed her on his first day on the job when he helped Nurse Jill transport a patient to some medical procedures. Sian, a connoisseur of female beauty, could not ignore the seductive legs and slender figure, which even the snow-white robe could not hide. An experienced man's eye photographed everything at once. Open gray eyes, plump lips, flawless skin, cute dimples on her cheeks, age about 30. One evening, Sean bumped into a nurse at a bus stop, a luxurious golden brown mop of hair scattered across her frail shoulders, which at work Jill hid under a white cap. Foster's breath was taken away with excitement, and there the lovely creature sat across from Foster, extolling the pastries of the place. I can't resist these buns, soft, airy, and hot. The whole diet goes by the wayside. Soon I won't be able to walk through the door. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. Sian laughed. Sian, you've been looking a little down lately. Are you all right? Jill asked with genuine concern. I'm all in. I'm just not a fun-loving kind of guy. I've never been much of a company man. Since then, Foster and Nurse Jill had lunch together every day, and they always had something to talk about. Sian didn't just like the girl on the outside. Jill had excellent professional qualities, worked with pleasure and diligence. She was able to find an approach even to the most malignant patient. She did not hurry home after hours, but stayed late at night. One day, Spencer stopped by the room where Sian was rearranging the bed. Where are you? he blurted out irritably. It was as if he'd caught an orderly having a cup of coffee in the break room. Quickly, they tidied up the operating room. I'll just finish up here, and then I'll get to it, Foster answered calmly. You know, Bernard, if I leave everything here, he'll make such a scandal. Are you deaf? If I don't see you in the operating room in a minute, I'll fire you. Spencer barked and stormed out of the room. Sian was confused. Go, Ron. He suddenly felt the soft touch of a hand on his elbow. Jill, how did she get here? Go ahead. I'll take care of it. 
The gray eyes gleamed amiably from beneath the cap. Sign it, or you really will be fired. Don't give them that pleasure. At home over a cup of tea, Foster suddenly remembered the nurse's words, don't give them that pleasure. Who's that for them? Jill was obviously not telling him something. Sian's hunch was confirmed when during their next meeting in the dining room, the girl suddenly said, I know why they treat you the way you do here. They even reprimanded me the other day, asking if I could find better company for my meals. What about you? I pretended not to take the hint. I've only been working here for six months, and I don't like everything either. Maybe the new head doctor will stop all this. What don't you like? Can you be more specific? Foster rushed the question, and the girl immediately closed up. Some things Jill answered evasively, and then turned the conversation to another topic. The next day, Foster, working the night shift, arrived at work early as usual. The doctors and nurses went home quickly, but Jill was in no hurry. She sat in the nursing room for a long time, then came out with a large bag in her hands and headed toward the host unit. What is a nurse to do in the kitchen late at night? So hungry that she couldn't wait to get home. Sian was burning with curiosity, so he followed her. The clinic's kitchen was staffed by excellent cooks. For each VIP client prepared a meal to his taste, but still plates with dinner were often left untouched and returned to the kitchen. Foster noticed with amazement how Jill walked over to the table set with the cool dishes, took out several small plastic containers from the bag, and began to carefully put the contents of the plates there. Sian was perplexed. Why is she doing this? Suddenly, it was as if Jill felt someone else's eyes on her. She turned around, saw the orderly, and turned pale with fear. Oh, it's not what you think. Worryingly, she began to make excuses. I'm not stealing. You don't think I am. Mrs. Janice, the head cook, said it was okay, but they'd throw it away anyway. Nobody needs it, so I'd better take it to my children. They're always so happy to have a present like this. What children? The man was surprised. To my twins. Didn't I tell you? I have two five-year-olds, Amy and Jake. Oh, I'm so embarrassed in front of you. I didn't do anything wrong, and it's embarrassing. Jill pressed her palms against her flaming cheek. It's okay, Foster smiled. May I ask you a question? If you have to feed your children hospital food, even the highest quality, it means your husband makes very little money. No, the nurse shook her head sadly. That means I don't have a husband. Jill trustingly told Seen her ingenuous story. She had had a hard time in her life since early childhood. An abandoned child, she had known no parents or family since birth and had grown up in an orphanage. I'm not complaining, Ron. I was very lucky to end up in this particular orphanage. The teachers and nurses were wonderful, and the principal, Beatrice Adams, was wonderful. She had a heart of gold, a great soul, especially my mother encouraged those who strive for knowledge. I always did well in school. After school, I went to medical school, graduated with honors. However, I didn't work in my profession for a long time. I married thanks to Chris, his parents, and I found my family for the first time. We had twins who were so funny and cute and smart. We were incredibly happy. My husband and I didn't quarrel once in three years, can you imagine? Why only in three years? Foster wondered. And then what happened? He was killed in a car crash. Jill answered succinctly and closed her eyes in pain, as if she were reliving the tragedy that had befallen her. Chris and Amy were barely two years old. If it hadn't been for my children, my husband's parents, I don't know how I would have survived all this horror. I had to take every job I could get. I had to live. Of course, my grandparents helped me, but I'm ashamed to take money from my elderly parents. Their pensions are small. They spend a lot of money on medicines alone. Six months ago, I was lucky to get a job in a private clinic. The salary is very good. I'll pay off the loan and I'll feel better at once. Okay, let's talk about something else. Jill. Foster started the conversation gently. You said you didn't like a lot of things here either. What exactly is there to know? The same as you, the nurse answered honestly. 
Do you think you're the only one who notices how the money for the treatment of VIP customers siphoned off into someone else's pocket? I wish I knew whose it was. Ron, don't lie. You don't do anything around here without permission. Spencer's that sneaky, greedy bug has had three of the chiefs sitting on him and framed him. I'm told he shares the illicit proceeds with the nursing staff, but it's a pittance. He keeps most of the proceeds for himself. We have two clinics here, one real and one clandestine. Spencer's. I also heard that he does some shenanigans with rare drugs, but I can't say for sure. And how does he put the envelope in his pocket? I've seen it myself. Our new head doctor, Peter Spencer, will come and eat it. Or maybe he wouldn't eat it, but choke on it. I'd be happy to do that. Is it okay? Give the term here in the near future such changes will happen. You will still astonish and your financial situation will improve. I promise. Thank you, Ron. Jill laughed, taking his words as a joke. How else could she relate to any of the predictions of the average orderly? Foster. Suddenly he wanted to respond with frankness to frankness and open up to the nurse. Tell her the truth, but the insistent ringing of his cell phone prevented him from doing so. All the next day and evening, Foster prepared for his appearance at the clinic as the new chief physician. He reviewed hundreds of times all the entries in the notebook, with which he had not parted for the past two weeks. Again, carefully studied all the documentation. Everything fit. All the strings lead to the Grey Cardinal, Peter Spencer. For several years, the deputy had been pestering hospitals for huge sums, receiving money from unspecified financial statements of VIP. Patience, patience. This brat managed to set up his own clinic in the clinic under the noses of the head doctors all by himself. As Jill put it, why though did all the nursing staff know about their boss's dealings? Knew and kept silent receiving a certain bribe for his poor eyesight. Sane involuntarily envied Spencer's equanimity, courage, brilliant organizational skills. Finally, Foster would take off those stupid glasses with simple glasses to which he could never get used. Sion stretched with a crunch in his joints and called Ron Marshall. In the early morning hours, a premium car pulled up outside the clinic's front porch. The driver quickly overtook the car and obligingly opened the back door for the influential passenger. A tall, broad-shouldered man in an expensive suit got out of the car and easily ran up the steps of the porch and headed straight for the chief physician's office. Spencer sat happily in someone else's chair. At the sight of his new boss, he was dumbfounded. I don't get it. Is this some kind of practical joke? Peter Spencer stared at Foster in confusion. Marshall? What's going on? Are you talking to me? The new chief physician is astonished. What exactly are you talking about now? Don't mind me. Spencer jumped up, giving way to the leader. How about some tea? Alas, we are not going to have time for tea now. Scene settled comfortably in his chair. A bottle of cognac won't be enough, but alcohol during working hours, you know. While I was resting, my men didn't sit idly by and got me some very curious information. Have a seat, Peter Spencer. This is going to be a long talk. After an hour, Spencer wiped his forehead with his handkerchief, closed himself, and said quietly, You can't prove anything. It's just a guess, unsupported by any evidence. You have no proof. I've got proof and witnesses. Take my word for it but there will always be people looking to get even with a greedy, greedy boss who's pretty much stopped sharing his loot lately. Foster was bluffing desperately, but Spencer believed him. Do you want to make a big deal out of this? No way. I've got something too, Peter Spencer grinned. Do you think you'll like the story of a crazy surgeon disguised as an orderly to expose villains who aren't there, a mania of persecution, so to speak? Do you think I didn't recognize you? At that time, there was a knock at the door. Ron Marshall himself looked in. Oh, I'm sorry, is Peter Spencer interrupting? I'm quitting here. Where should I go now? To the personnel department? Where else? Instead of Spencer, the orderly was answered by the new chief medical officer. You're an adult, really. 
Can't you see that this is a serious conversation? I apologize. Marshall hurriedly closed the door. To say that the deputy was shocked was to say nothing. Completely stunned by this turn of events, he didn't even notice that Marshall had grown a small but thick mustache in just one night. I'll get the money back in a faded voice, Spencer promised. Most of it, most of it. Foster grinned bitterly. A lot of time has been lost. Unfortunately for us, unfortunately for you, we'll hardly know how much money you've managed to steal over the years. You are fired. How about letting me resign? Hopelessly asked the deputy. You're fired. Foster replied nonchalantly. And thinking that's for you, you bastard, for Hugh James. A few hours later, the whole clinic was in earshot. The news of the omnipotent Spencer's dismissal spread through the hospital at the speed of sound. The shocked staff whispered about the unpredictable behavior of the new chief physician. They didn't know what to expect from this autocrat in the near future. The fact that Foster remarkably resembled the orderly, Marshall impressed the staff far less than Cian had anticipated. People were more worried about their own fate. After the lunch break, the entire nursing staff gathered in the conference room at the behest of the new management. Cian stood in front of the staff and, after greeting them, gave a brief but impressive speech. You all know about the firing of acting chief medical officer Spencer. You all know what sins he was fired for. You are no saints yourselves, and if I could, I would fire practically everyone in this room right now, but highly skilled workers are worth their weight in gold these days. You are excellent specialists. I wish you had a little more conscience and honesty, but that's everyone's personal choice. From now on, a new life begins at the clinic. If anyone does not agree with the new policy, I am waiting for your resignation letter. It's up to you to decide now. I won't be able to get in the way. I warn you. Well, that's about it. Go to work. There are sick people waiting for you. A week later, the new chief physician, to the great surprise of the staff, appointed Jill head nurse. At the end of the day, there was a timid knock on the door of his office. May I, Sean Foster, please have a seat. Thank you. The nurse cautiously sat down on the edge of her chair. I'm very grateful to you for the appointment. But, excuse me, let me ask you straight out. Why me? I've only been here a short time. They're a better candidate. I've already chosen the most worthy one, Foster said firmly. I am completely satisfied with your professional qualities. What has nothing to do with it? And what, in fact, upset you? You did not get anyone in trouble. Patricia retired of her own accord. Remember how happy she was to be able to spend more time with her beloved grandchildren. You should have said thank you. Thank you very much, hurriedly, Jill, without noticing the sly smile in his eyes. Actually, you can't get away with a simple thank you. May I take advantage of my position and invite you to dinner? You can? Can I think about an answer? Of course. Already on the threshold, the nurse turned around. I was already thinking Saturday 6, 0 p.m. I'm free. Thanks for the invitation, Ron. I had lunch with you every day. Did you think I wouldn't recognize you? Jill laughed reproachfully and left the office, leaving Foster to burn with shame. Six months later, the clinic's revenues were growing before their eyes. Shareholders and the board of directors could not be happy with the new chief physician. In his personal life, too, Foster underwent a major change. He had been dating Jill for almost five months. It was a true, sincere, unconditional, and mutual love. One evening, walking Jill home, Cian didn't let her out of the car for a long time. Before saying a few cherished words, he gathered his spirits like an excited schoolboy. Look, I would have proposed to you a long time ago. If it weren't for one thing, which one? Jill was surprised. I haven't gotten permission yet from two very important people. I mean Chris and Amy, he explained. Don't you think it's time they met their future stepfather? You're so sure I'm going to tell you, aren't you? The young woman teased him. Honestly, I'm sure, Sean admitted. Why, or am I wrong? 
you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Jill reached out to him. Over the weekend, Foster and Jill and the twins visited an amusement park. The little company had a wonderful time. Chris, Amy, and Mom's good friend really enjoyed themselves. Mr. Cian enjoyed playing with them, goofing around, lavishing them with goodies at the cozy kids' cafe and shouting louder than the kids on the scary rides. You're acting like a boy, gently whispered Jill, kissing him on the cheek. Does that upset you? Foster scratched the back of his head, puzzled. On the contrary, I'm thrilled. The children like you so much. The eyes of the woman she loved shone with happiness. Already on the way home in the car, Cian asked the kids, What did you like most about today? Everything. The twins answered in unison. After a little silence, Amy shyly added, And if you lived with us, you'd like it even more. Really? But I'd have to marry your mother to do it. Cian winked cheerfully at Jill. Get married. The children shouted in chorus. You have to get her consent first. She agrees. We know our mother better than that. If she's smiling like that, she's okay with it, Amy reassured her. Mommy, tell me. I agree. Seriously. Jill nodded. The twins, overwhelmed by the vivid experience, fell asleep right in the car. Foster helped his sweetheart carry the children home and put them to bed. Saying goodbye in the hallway, the new groom smiled guiltily. Jill, I'm sorry. It was such a spontaneous suggestion. Don't feel bad about it. I'll be sure to make everything beautiful. The restaurant, the ring, the candles, the sea of flowers. What a fool that Foster is. Jill put her arms around him. Who needs all that banality with candles and rose petals? I couldn't even dream of such a marriage proposal. Did you see the children cheering? Of course I have. Now all you have to do is to meet my mother. It was kind of scary, Jill admitted. What if she didn't like it? Are you out of your mind? Foster was indignant. How could you not like you? My mother is amazing. She'll know at once what a treasure her son has got. All the more reason will take the heavy artillery with us. No one can resist Chris and Amy. They'll charm anyone. The lovers did not hold lavish celebrations and celebrated the wedding in a cozy restaurant among close friends and relatives. Seen on such an important day for him was pleased to see his beloved mother of cousins, Ron Marshall and his wife and daughters, Monica Perkins, and her husband, Hugh James, and her husband, Hugh James, and his wife and grandparents, Chris and Amy. For two months now, Hugh had been the deputy chief physician at the Foster Clinic, dancing with his adoringly beautiful wife. Cian felt like an infinitely happy man, and Jill nodded behind him with a smile. Look, Foster turned around and saw the happy twins, swarming both sides of their new grandmother. Maria Foster looked twenty years younger, so much fun she was having with her grandchildren. Cian Foster, I'd like to make an appointment with you. Surprised by his wife, for God's sake, on what subject? On a personal basis, of course. Can't this issue be solved at home? We could, Jill agreed, but I'd still like it to be more formal. On Wednesday, as promised, Jill Foster showed up for an appointment with the chief physician. Seen. Admittedly, had managed to forget about the conversation at the wedding. I hear you, Mrs. Foster, he said with pleasure, his own last name in the feminine form. Sean Foster, I'd like to talk to you about the new charge nurse. Do you think Jennifer Smith is the right person for the job? But this place is already taken, isn't it? Cian played cautiously, not understanding where his wife was going. Or are you going somewhere? I hope not right away. No, Jill agreed. Not now. But in a couple of months, I'll have to leave this post. Why not worry about a decent replacement beforehand? Are you serious or are you joking? Foster didn't understand. Somebody hinted that the wife of the head was in a special position, and you decided to leave the clinic for good. Why forever? Just maternity leave. 
Jill loved watching her confused husband. What kind of a maternity leave? Sian was at a loss for words. Foster, you've gone completely, sighed Jill. Don't you know what kind of maternity leave women take? We're having a baby, my love. The joyful news seemed to drown out Sian. He looked at his wife with delight, feeling the happy tears coming to his throat and could not utter a word. Their firstborn, the Fosters, were named Steve, after Sian's father. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.